All right, welcome back, guys. Today we are gonna go over Seneca's letter, Moral Letters to Lucilius, Lucilius letter 55. And this is the first of the weekly videos. So I know that some of you guys are disappointed that I went from the daily to the weekly, but I have a video explaining that. And uh, hopefully you'll get even more value out of these as I'll have more time to dissect these, uh, these letters as well. So, all right, let's jump into this here. He says here, this is on uh, letter 55 on Vitaya's villa. He says here, I have just returned from a ride in my litter, and I am as weary as if I had walked the distance instead of being seated. Even to be carried for any length of time is hard work, perhaps all the more so because it is an unnatural exercise. For nature gives us legs with which to do our own walking and eyes with which to do our own seeing. Our luxuries have condemned us to weakness. We have ceased to be able to do that which we have long declined to do. So he's saying here that, you know, obviously he's being carried. <laughs> he's, uh, he's traveling, not by his own feet. And he, he's talking about this idea that, you know, it, it even feels exhausting to, to be carried, <laughs> right? Um, and he's saying it's, it's an unnatural exercise because you're, you're given legs, you're given eyes, right? You're supposed to use those. Uh, but the luxuries that we have have basically made us weak, okay? And, and after we don't do something for a long time, uh, we're, eight, we're unable to do that thing, right? So I don't know what the case is here. I'm not assuming that Seneca can't walk, but... You know, there, there's a lot of things that we can't do. If you think about society today and a lot of people that are out of shape and, and don't exercise, they, they can't even do the activities that a normal human should be able to do. But it's not just the activities, uh, the physical activities, but it's, it's a lot of other things that the luxuries of life has prevented us from being able to do, right? I mean, if you think about it, can you uh, make your own fire? Can you... Uh, you know, can you cook your own food? I mean, maybe you can, but I'm just saying that a lot of times the luxuries make it so that we do become weak and then we can't do the things that we should be able to do. In verse two, he says, nevertheless, I found it necessary to give my body a shaking up in order that the bile which has gathered in my throat, if that was my trouble, might be shaken out, or if the very breath within me had become for some reason too thick, that the jolting which I have felt was a good thing for me might make it thinner. So I insisted on being carried longer than usual along an attractive beach, which, which bends between Cumae and Servilius Vitae's country house, shut in, the, shut in by the ocean, by the sea on one side, and the lake on the other. Just like a narrow path, I was packed firm, it was packed firm under, underfoot because of a recent storm, since, as you know, the waves, when they beat upon the beach hard and fast, level it out, but a continuous period of fair weather loosens it when the sand, which is kept firm by the water, loses its moisture." Okay, so he's giving a pretty detailed description here of this place that he's visiting. And I do like the description that, that he has here because you can you can really sense what this place is, right? There's this villa, okay, on one side is the ocean, on one side is the lake. So there's this strip of land that he's going across and it's hardened, uh, you know, from, uh, he's saying, from, from, the, from the moisture, from the, the waves, right? It's made this kind of hard packed down uh, land that this this sand that that he's he's walking on or that that he's visiting okay um in verse three he says here as my habit is i begin to look around look about for something there that there that might be of service to me when my eyes fell upon the villa which had belonged to vatia so this was the place where the famous Praetorian millionaire passed his old age he was famed for nothing else than his life of leisure and he was regarded as lucky only for that reason. For whenever men were ruined by their friendship with Asinius Gallus, whenever others were ruined by their hatred of Sejanus and later by their intimacy with him, for it was no more dangerous to have offended him than to have loved him, people used to cry out, O Vatia, you alone know how to live. Okay, so what he's saying here is that the language is a little bit hard to dissect here. Okay, uh, let me try and read, read this part one more time uh, so that it, it makes a little bit more sense. For whenever men were ruined by their friendships with Asinius Galus, whenever others were ruined by their hatred of Sejanus, and later by their intimacy with him, for it was no more dangerous to have offended him than to have loved him. Okay, so what he's saying here is he's saying that this guy, okay, he was this, this millionaire, he, he was famous for living this life of leisure, okay? And he said that <clears throat> um, whenever these men were ruined by their friendships with Asinius 
uh, Gallus, okay? And others were ruined by their hatred of Sejanus and later uh, by their intimacy with him. So uh, he, he's saying that when these things happened, right, because, because these things happened, it was more dangerous. It was no more dangerous to have offended him than to have loved him. So be, being associated with this guy in any way was dangerous, right? Because you could be ruined by by being an enemy of his, but you could also be ruined by by loving him, by by him uh, him him liking you, and then growing bored with you, right? So he was saying it was just it was just a dangerous place to be to be associated with this guy because he was such an unstable guy because he was living this life. Uh, this life of luxury, okay, and because he was so famous, and because so many people were so jealous, because of all of these these interactions that he had with other people as well, right? So, uh, you could think of it as sort of uh, Epstein almost, right? Like, you know, it was kind of pretty dangerous to be affiliated with with the guy, either good or bad, right? That that's 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 maybe a picture that you could you could have in your head, all right? In verse four, he says. But what he knew was how to hide, not how to live. And it makes a great deal of difference whether your life be one of leisure or one of idleness. So I never drove past his country place during Vitea's lifetime without saying to myself, here lies Vitea. Okay, so what he's saying here is he's saying, look, there is a difference between living a life of leisure, okay, and one of idleness, right? And, and he's saying that in this case, Vitea was living this life of idleness. He wasn't really doing anything. Right. And 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 what he would say when he drove by there is he's saying, Here lies Vitae, he's dead. Right. Seneca is considering him to be dead. He he's he, he's worthless. Like a lot of people are worshiping this guy, saying, How great is he? Because he's living this life of luxury. And uh, and Seneca's saying, No, that's that's not the case. But my dear Lucius, philosophy is a thing of holiness, something to be worshipped, so much so that the very counterfeit pleases. Okay, so he's saying the counterfeit to what uh, the opposite of, of what uh, you know, of, 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 of philosophy of, of this, it actually pleases people, right? Because he says, for the mass of mankind considers that a person is at leisure who has withdrawn from society, is free from care, self-sufficient, and lives for himself. But these privileges can only be the reward of the wise man. So he's saying here that, look, <clears throat> society would say this, right? That a, a person uh, is at leisure if they've withdrawn from society, they're free from care, self-sufficient, and lives for themselves. But he's saying that you can only have these things by being a wise man, okay? And here's why. <laughs> Does he who is a victim of anxiety know how to live for himself, right? What? Does he even know? And that is of first importance, how to live at all. <clears throat> so he's, he's questioning, he's saying, look, this guy, even though he was living this life of luxury and he was in seclusion, <clears throat> does he actually know how to live, right? If he's full of anxiety, is he really living a life of leisure? I don't think so. In verse 5, he says, For the man who has fled from affairs and from men, who has been banished to seclusion by the unhappiness which his own desires have brought upon him, who cannot see his neighbor more happy than himself, who through fear has taken to concealment like a frightened and sluggish animal, this person is not living for himself. He's living for his belly, his sleep, his lust. And that is the most shameful thing in the world. He who lives for no one does not necessarily live for himself. Nevertheless, there is so much instead fastness and adherence to one's purpose that even sluggishness, if stubbornly maintained, assumes an air of authority with us. So what he's saying here is he's saying this, look, <clears throat> this guy, okay, who's fled from affairs and men, he's, he's, he's essentially been banished to seclusion by his unhappiness, the unhappiness that his own desires have brought upon him, okay? He can't see his neighbor more happy, all right, he, he's he's doing this through fear. He's concealing things through fear. Uh, he's he's not really living for himself. He's living for his desires, his belly, his sleep, his lust. Okay, he's saying that's the most shameful thing in the world, because a person that doesn't live for anyone does not necessarily live for himself. So he's saying, making this distinction that if you're living for yourself, it it's not this. It's not just living this life of luxury where you've secluded yourself from other people, enjoying your. Uh, desires. That's that fulfilling your desires. That's not what it's about. Okay. That, that's not it at all. Okay. But he is saying that, look, if you stick to this, right, even someone who is sluggish, if stubbornly maintained, they assume some kind of a air of authority with us. So he was famous. People did uh, value him and honor him, even though we know that, you know, what, what the reality of the situation was. In verse six, he says, 
I could not describe the villa accurately, for I'm familiar only with the front of the house and with the parts which are public, which are in public view and can be seen by the mere passerby. There are two grottos, which cost a great deal of labor, as big as the most spacious hall made by hand. One of these does not admit the rays of the sun, while the other keeps them until the sun sets. There's also a stream running through a grove of plane trees, which draws for its supply both on the sea and on Lake Archeon. It intersects the grove just like a raceway. It is large enough to support fish, although its waters are continually being drawn off. When the sea is calm, however, they do not use the stream, only touching the well-stocked waters when the storm gives the fishermen a forced holiday. So he's giving a, a pretty good description of the villa. You know, it's not so important as, as aside to understand how luxurious this, this truly was. In verse 7, he says, But the most convenient thing about the villa is the fact that Baye is next door. It is free from all the inconveniences of that resort and yet enjoys its pleasures. I myself understand these attractions and I believe that it is a villa suited to every season of the year. It fronts the west wind, which it intercepts in such a way that Baye is denied it. So it seems that Vitaya was no fool when he selected this place as it is as the best in which to spend his leisure when it was already unfruitful and decrepit. So he's saying here, you know, we, if you remember from one of the previous letters talking about Baia, this resort, this kind of very luxurious place, it's near there, right? But it's not right there. And it actually is better than it because it gets all the pleasures of that, all, all the, the benefits of it, but even more so, right? And so he's saying, look, this guy knew what he was doing when he was selecting the most luxurious place to live. In verse 8, he says, The place where one lives, however, can contribute little towards tranquility. It is the mind which must make everything agreeable to itself. I have seen men despondent in a gay and lovely villa. I have seen them to all appearance full of business in the midst of solitude. For this reason, you should not refuse to believe that your life is well placed merely because you are not now in Campania. But why are you not there? Just let your thoughts travel even to this place. So what he's saying here is he's saying, look, it doesn't matter where you live. That's not what's going to give you tranquility. It's the mind, okay? And he says that I've seen guys that are in really nice places uh, that that are, are miserable, okay? Um, and I've seen them be, look like they're full of business, right? They're supposed to be leisurely, but they're not in, in, in the midst of, of solitude, okay? So d don't just think that because you're in this place that now you've made it because just being there is, is not, is not enough. Okay. Um, he's saying, you know, why are you, are you not there? Just let your thoughts travel even to this place. Right. So, so now he's going to sort of talk about how you can be where you want to be in the mind. He says here in verse nine, you may hold converse with your friends when they're absent. And indeed, as often as you wish, and for as long as you wish, for we enjoy this, the greatest of pleasures, all the more when we are absent from one another. For the presence of friends makes us fastidious, and because we can at any time talk or sit together, when once we have parted, we give not a thought to those whom we have just beheld. So he's saying here that, and this is a little bit hard to get here, so you can converse with your friends when they're absent. So even when your friends aren't here, you can converse with them in your mind, okay? And as, as long as you want, okay? Uh, and he's saying, we enjoy this. It's the greatest of pleasures. Um, all the more when we're absent from one another. So we can remember, we can we can think about our, our friends, okay? And and he's saying that, you know, s sometimes uh, when they've parted, uh, we, we give not a thought to whom we have just beheld, right? So, so at that point in time, we don't realize uh, the value of that of that friend, but later on we talk to them in our mind and and, and we we run that over. In verse ten, he says, "And we ought to bear the, the absence of friends cheerfully, just because everyone is bound to be often absent from his friends, even when they are present, including among such cases. In the first place, the nights spent apart, then the different engagements which each of." two friends has, then the private studies of each and their excursions into the country, and you will see that foreign travel does not rob us of much. So he's saying that, look, you know, we should be okay with not always being in the presence of our friends because, you know, it's, it's gonna, we're not going to be around them all the time. OK, um, and he's saying that, you know, there's a lot of reasons for this, right? It, it's because we have different schedules. We have different things going on. OK, and that's fine. All right. But he says this in verse 11. A friend should be retained in spirit. Such a friend can never be absent. He can see every day whomsoever he desires to see. 
He can see every day whomsoever he desires to see. I would therefore have you share your studies with me, your meals and your walks. We should be living within two narrow limits if anything were barred to your thoughts. I see you, my dear Lucilius, at this very moment. I hear you. I am with you to such an extent that I hesitate whether I should not begin to write you notes instead of letters. Farewell. So, you know, he's, he's making the case here and he's saying that, look, we should keep a friend in spirit, right? You know, just because you're not physically here with me does not mean that we can't, you know, I can't, you can't be there in spirit. I can, I can, as I'm studying and, and having my meals and going for walks, I can be in your presence. I can, I can think about you and, and, and think about how you are and, and have these kind of conversations with you in my head. And he's saying that I can, I can see you so closely here, you know, he, he's talking to Lucilius, um, and, and hear you so to such an extent that which, which he's wondering, should I just be writing you notes instead of long letters, like just a note here, like in, in giving you this note, right? And so, you know, obviously he's, he's exaggerating this, but to make his point, which is that, you know, a true friend doesn't just have to be present in order for you to experience their company or to, to get value uh, from them or, you know, to... Uh, to commune with them. Like you, you can do that from what you understand and what you know of them. And, and that's a valuable thing to, to do is to, to think about your friends or even your, the, the teachers that you have, uh, you know, you know, there is a, in, in the book, uh, what is it? Uh, Think and Grow Rich, uh, Napoleon Hill talks about having like a mastermind and, and having all these great thinkers from from history, like conversing with them and, and having the, you know people that you uh, you converse with in your mind. And I think there's some some value in doing that because you can kind of know what a person would say or what they would do, and you can sort of have that conversation yourself. So, anyway, that is it for today and for this week. I'll see you next week. Take care.